presentation. This was like during the COVID era, and I'd be teaching on Zoom. Every time I'd want to get my lecture ready and I'd pull up OneNote, my computer would freeze, I would reboot it, and then I would have to install a system update. So that's what we just went through. Apparently I haven't updated in a while. <clears throat> anyway, so I'd like to tell you a story today. It's kind of developed over the last 15, 20 years. Um, and uh, I hope it'll be complimentary to Fabien's talk. Um, so I'll try to give sort of two entry points to the subject, and I'm gonna create a concrete problem, and uh, I'm gonna set up something in topology, and then I'm gonna reset up the same thing in algebra. So if you like one or the other, then hopefully it'll help inform your point of view on the other one. Um, so let's get going. So I'd like to talk about splitting problems for vector bundles in topology. Uh, so I'm gonna start out with a nice space. Oh, and I should apologize, I'm sure over the last few years some of you have heard variants of this talk before, so uh, if, you will, if you have, you're gonna be bored, but anyway. So I'm gonna start with a nice space, a manifold, a CW complex or something, and the key point is gonna be something of dimension D, that number will be important later. And uh, I'm gonna be interested in describing the set of real rank R vector bundles on this space. So ideally we wanna get information about our manifold and this set is some sort of proxy, some kind of linear information about, uh, about the manifold. So we'd like to give some sort of description of it. So one of the basic things you prove when you're studying vector bundles is that uh, there's a notion of homotopy invariance for vector bundles. So if you look at isomorphism classes, uh, and if I is the unit interval, then if you pull back along the projection map from M cross the interval to M, then that's a bijection. All right, so this allows us to turn what is a priori a geometric problem into one which is a homotopy problem. Uh, and so what we can do is build some space which allows us to classify vector bundles, which Fabian alluded to in his talk. So for concreteness, let me look at the Grassmannian of R-dimensional subspaces of an infinite dimensional real vector space. This is some infinite dimensional manifold. In fact, it's an increasing union of nice finite dimensional things. Uh, and the most important thing about this is that it carries a universal or tautological vector bundle. So over each point of the Grassmannian, you can look at the subspace of this infinite dimensional vector space, which corresponds to that given subspace. Um, and it has rank R. All right, so how does this thing actually classify uh, vector bundles? Well, if I have a continuous map to the Grassmannian, then I can pull back the universal or tautological bundle and get a vector bundle on M. And one of the basic things that one proves uh, is that in fact every bundle arises in this way, and that's the Puntrog and Steenrod classification theorem. So if you want, uh, given a vector bundle, you can choose a collection of generating sections, and that allows me to build a continuous map to the Grassmannian, and uh, up to homotopy, those are all uh, vector bundles. So in other words, up to homotopy, the choice of generating sections doesn't matter. All right, so this, is, this was sort of a landmark result this is from like the late, 1940s, uh, and it allows us to turn all kinds of questions about describing the set of vector bundles into a problem about describing the set of homotopy classes of maps, and over the years, people have developed many techniques for addressing that kind of problem. So let me give you a concrete problem that'll sort of motivate what we're gonna do in the rest of the talk. So there's a stabilization map. If I have the Grassmannian of R minus one dimensional subspaces, uh, then there's a map which classifies adding a trivial bundle of rank one. And this is classified by map from GRR minus one to GRR. So one question I can ask, um, well, let me say that a bundle has a nowhere vanishing section uh, if and only if it splits off a trivial rank one sum end. Right. And we get a lifting problem out of this. So if we wanna ask, given 
a bundle which can be generated uh, of rank R, when can it, uh, when is it of the form uh, a trivial bundle of rank one, direct sum of the rank R minus one bundle, then we can phrase this as sort of a, a lifting problem. I have this stabilization map, I have the classifying map of my given vector bundle, and my question about when it splits is, uh, is the problem of when I can lift along the stabilization map. All right, so I'd like to analyze this problem in general, and so, uh, so this is the, the, the general question. When does, when does a bundle have a nowhere vanishing section of a given, a given rank? So let me start with a closed manifold of dimension D and uh, fix some bundle on it. So the situation is gonna break down depending on the rank relative to the dimension. So let me give that a name, and I'm gonna call it the co-rank of E, that's the, of C, that's the, the difference between the dimension and the rank. All right, so maybe the first basic fact is a, is a general position argument. If the rank is larger than the dimension, then if I choose a sufficiently generic section, it'll always have a nowhere vanishing section. I mean, it will be nowhere vanishing. So in other words, I can always find a lift in that diagram assuming uh, my rank is larger than the dimension. All right, so this case is maybe not so interesting, but it'll be important for uh, the algebraic problem I talk about later. So let me consider the first case, which is really uh, interesting. So uh, this may be what you might call the critical case, and this is when the rank is equal to the dimension. So I have a manifold of dimension D, and I have a rank D vector bundle on it. So again, I'm asking the question, when can I split off a trivial rank one sum and? Or when does this bundle have a nowhere vanishing section? All right, so there is an obstruction to existence of a nowhere vanishing section, which is sort of tautological. If I pick a suitably generic section, I can look at its vanishing locus, and uh, I can look at the cohomology class that's point grade dual to that. So right now I haven't imposed any orientation conditions, and so that's why uh, the, the point grade duality might be twisted in some way, and that's why I call this the, the twisted Euler class. So if the bundle has a nowhere vanishing section, then the twisted Euler class should vanish. All right, so let me just say a few words about this because it'll come up later. Uh, if I look at the Grassmannian of the real Grassmannian, then its fundamental group is Z mod two, uh, given by means of the determinant. And um, if I have a vector bundle, then I get an orientation character, which is just given by applying the fundamental group to the classifying map. And uh, that defines an orientation local system. So if you aren't familiar with twisted point gray duality, you can ignore all of this for the moment, but It'll, like I said, come back later. And so the basic theorem is that uh, if I'd like to know the answer to this splitting problem uh, in this critical case, in fact, the vanishing of the Euler class is the only obstruction. All right, so the Euler class is this cohomology class and it, uh, it lives in this group. Uh, so if my manifold is oriented, then I can assume that, and I choose a compatible orientation of the vector bundle, then this is just the top cohomology of M with integral coefficients. All right, so this theorem is kind of prototypical for what I'd like to say later, so uh, the important things that I want you to remember are that the dimension is equal to the rank and there's only one obstruction. All right, so let me give a sketch of the proof of this. So I can look at this map, the stabilization map, and if that map was a homotopy equivalence because the classification problem is a homotopy problem, then I would always be able to choose a section. So let me measure the failure of this map to be uh, a homotopy equivalence. And that's described by the homotopy fiber. And so you have this fiber sequence uh, where the R minus one sphere intercedes and is measuring the failure of this thing, uh, this map to be a, an equivalence. So going back to also the 1940s, there's a, there, well, a host of inductive procedures for deciding when I can study these lifting problems. And the idea intuitively is that I'd like to think of this, 
Grassmannian of R minus one planes is sort of built out of the Grassmannian of R planes by attaching cells in a suitable way. So then, uh, and the cells I'd like to add are sort of controlled by this R minus one sphere. And so I get a, a procedure I can sort of try to inductively extend along the skeleton of this uh, uh, to get from GRR to GRR minus one, and I'll get a collection of cohomological obstructions to do that. So this idea was sort of built up by Eilenberg, and it's detailed in Steenrod's Topology of Fiber Bundles book. Um, I don't want to go into the details too much, but maybe the one point that I'd like to make is that uh, the obstructions depend on the unstable homotopy of the R minus one sphere. All right, so let me say something a little more concrete now. So where does the Euler class come from? Well, one of the first things you do in topology is you study the degree map from, uh, so you're interested in endomorphisms of the, of the sphere, and uh, equivalently, you can look at pointed homotopy classes of maps from the R minus one sphere to itself, and uh, the Brouwer degree gives you a bijection between that group and the integers. And the point that I'd like to make here is that this answer is uh, independent of R, at least if R is bigger than equal to two, of course if R is equal to one, uh, pi naught is a set, so maybe you shouldn't think about it. And I said this procedure was sort of inductive based on uh, the cells, and the dimension hypothesis implies that there's only, implies that there's only one obstruction. Um, basically, these sort of cohomology classes that you get by attaching cells are all gonna vanish uh, if, I, if I'm above the dimension, and so the, there's only one, the other class is the only thing that's going to potentially obstruct being able to lift in this map. All right, so this is a general procedure, and uh, I'd like to bring this back later. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, this group is stable, and so the answer is independent of R. All right, so this is also a paradigm for how these proofs are gonna go in general. Uh, if you wanna answer this kind of question, you stare at that fiber sequence above, and you're gonna have to write down a bunch of obstructions. So let me, just for the sake of um, illustration, describe the next case. All right, so suppose now I have a manifold of dimension D plus one, and I'm gonna impose some condition on the dimension, which I'll describe why that's in place in a moment. And suppose, for simplicity, I have an oriented rank D vector bundle in X. Uh, sorry, X is supposed to be M. All right, so now I'd like to ask, again, when does, uh, when does this bundle split off a trivial rank one sum N? Well, we already know that there's a primary obstruction, which is the cohomology class point grade rule to a, a generic section, and so that's the Euler class. And because of this orientation business, like I mentioned earlier, uh, I've thrown away the uh, twisted coefficients, and so this obstruction is definitely in place because it was there before. And there's one more obstruction, which is a little bit harder to describe, but there's a secondary obstruction, and it's in the D plus first cohomology of M with Z mod two coefficients. Now, this obstruction isn't quite well defined there. Roughly speaking, if I take the Euler class, then I can take two different witnesses of it being trivial, two different null homotopies, and then get a new class in HD plus one by sort of gluing those two null homotopies together. And this business on the right-hand side, in terms of cohomological invariance, uh, is, uh, is basically measuring the well-definedness of those, those choices of null homotopies. So if I modify the null homotopies on either side, how does the resulting cohomology class change? And the point is that it changes in a very, very controlled fashion, coming from square two, and some information coming from the bundle, the, from the bundle that's purely topological, namely the second Stiefel-Whitney class. All right, so again, it's sort of nice to, I mean, it's, it's nice that this has a really uh, explicit answer, and uh, again, this is sort of a very, very old kind of question. I mean, this is Sam Liao's thesis from 1954. Uh, so what's the proof of this? Well, it's very, very similar. 
So again, because of the dimensional hypothesis, you can run this sort of obstruction theory machine that I described, and we have this primary obstruction, which is the Euler class, and uh, because of the dimension condition, that's, there's only one other obstruction, and one has to work hard to sort of describe what it is, but uh, you can do so and see that it has this particular form. All right, and now I want to explain why I assume this uh, d bigger than or equal to four condition. So these obstructions come from the homotopy of the r minus one sphere, and the d homotopy of the d minus one sphere uh, is not independent of d. So if d is equal to three, it's the integers. Uh, this is Hopf's famous map from the three sphere to the two sphere. And if d is greater than equal to four, then it's z mod two generated by a suitable suspension of the Hopf map. So we see this situation breaks up into two, uh, two ranges. One is the case where d is, equal to, d is bigger than or equal to four, and we have this sort of systematic or regular obstruction. And I didn't even make a statement for d is equal to three, but you can modify this kind of statement um, when d is equal to three, and there is a description of the corresponding secondary obstruction, but it's a little bit more involved. It takes a slightly different form than what happens for uh, higher d. That's right. And the square two gets replaced by a Pontragon squaring operation. And, uh, all right. Okay, so what I want you to take away from this is that when you study these uh, splitting problems, because of this, the form of the homotopy of the, the, the sphere, uh, we're gonna find ourselves in different situations that are either stable or unstable. All right. And so here we see, if you can see it, uh, the situation is stable if d is bigger than or equal to four, and unstable when d is equal to three. All right, so you can keep going with this, and uh, people did so for quite some time. If you go back to the 1960s, uh, there's a book of Emory Thomas seminar on fiber spaces where he sits down and describes these kinds of obstructions. It becomes increasingly cumbersome, but at least in practice, one can solve these kinds of problems. All right, any questions so far? All right, so that's the topological motivation and introduction. And so I'd now like to talk about the corresponding problem in uh, algebraic geometry, in particular in affine algebraic geometry, or if you want commutative ring theory. All right, so suppose I have a commutative, commutative unital ring, uh, I said this talk was from matrices to motivic homotopy theory, so where are the matrices? Remember that an R module is called projective, it's a direct sum and of a free R module. But there are a bunch of equivalent conditions for being projective, which, uh, there's the lifting characterization of projective modules. Uh, if you have a map from P to an R module M and a surjective, map, then you can always lift along that surjection. <clears throat> but there's also, and this is where the matrices come from, uh, there's a linear algebraic description, at least if P is finally generated. Uh, so once you use that splitting condition, you, uh, you can find an integer n and a projection operator, so a matrix. Uh, with coefficients in R, so the fact that it's a projection operator is the condition epsilon squared equals epsilon, and then the P is the image of that projection operator. So, as far as I understand, this is why projective modules are called projective. All right, uh, so I'm only gonna be interested in these finally generated projective modules. All right, now, why is this similar to this topological problem? Um, this idea goes back to Serre, at least, um, and th the idea is that projective modules are the same thing as vector bundles. So if I have a ring, then I can always take its prime spectrum, that's a topological space with the Zariski topology, it has a basis of open sets, 
usually we write these d of f. Uh, and these are roughly the complement of the vanishing locus of f equals zero. And if I have a finally generated projective module, then you can find uh, finally many elements f1 through fn, which sort of which generate the unit ideal, uh, in other words, which form a cover of the space by these basic open sets, such that when you restrict P to this open set, in other words, if you localize uh, then, or invert this Fi, then P with that element inverted is in fact a free module. All right, so the way we build vector bundles in topology is that they are locally vector spaces. So you have an open cover of your space. When you restrict your vector bundle to a suitable open cover, it becomes trivial, and then you glue things together. And so this idea makes it clear that projective modules are sort of very similar to that. So if I have a projective module, then it gives, in fact, a vector bundle on spec R, which is locally trivial for the Zariski topology, instead of the classical topology. All right, and this is really a dictionary. Uh, if you have a compact manifold, and you can, look, and you can look at the ring of continuous real valued functions on M, and you can ask, well, what are the finally generated projective modules over C of M? Well, given a vector bundle, I can always look at the module of continuous sections of this, this bundle, and the uh, basic fact is that that's a projective module. And, this is sometimes called the sarah squan correspondence, that there's a bijection between isomorphism classes of finite rank vector bundles over M and finally, projected, finally generated projective C of M modules. All right, so this leads to what's sometimes called Sarah's dictionary. If I have a commutative ring, then the modules that are locally free in the sense that I described before uh, are projective, and in fact, finite rank vector bundles over spec R. Now, finite rank vector bundles means with respect to the Zariski topology are exactly the same thing as finitely generated projective R modules. Okay, so if vector bundles are, uh, if projective modules are like vector bundles, then when I have some dimension uh, hypotheses, then I can try to formulate the same kinds of questions that I, I wrote before. Uh, so suppose I have an Ethereum ring and assume it has some dimension D, and I have a projective module of rank R, and as before, let me write uh, VR for the set of isomorphism classes of rank R projectives, or equivalently, rank R vector bundles. Um, and as before, I'll talk about the co-rank. Well, in topology, I was interested in this stabilization map. If I have a vector bundle, I can add a trivial rank one sum end. Here, uh, if I have a projective module, I can also add a trivial rank one sum end, namely take the direct sum with R. And this determines a stabilization function from uh, rank R minus one projective modules to rank R projective modules. And I can ask the same kinds of questions. When can I uh, characterize the image? Can I describe the fibers, et cetera? So maybe the theorem that got this all started uh, is Serre, who is very aware of that general position argument that, uh, that allowed you to show that if you had a vector bundle of rank R bigger than the dimension, then it always had a nowhere vanishing section. Well, the corresponding statement here is that uh, the stabilization map is surjective is if R is bigger than D. All right, so the situation in algebra is exactly the same as the situation in topology under this dictionary. And in fact, Serre's proof was really kind of a, an algebra geometric avatar of the, the sort of general position argument that one gives in topology. All right, so in 64, in his famous paper, K-theory and stable algebra, Bass asked this question, uh, can you characterize the image of SR in general? All right. Well, question? Um, could you repeat how SR was defined? Just take the direct sum of, given a projective module, just add a trivial rank one sum n. Any other questions? Could you say a little bit more about how it's like breaking out the in general? Um, I don't want to. Okay. 
I mean, if you look at the proof, it really is kind of. Part of the problem is that you have a hard time sort of making sense of what a generic section is. And so, you know, what does general even mean? All right, so um, I'd like to talk about what happens in co-rank zero. So now I'm assuming some more conditions. Uh, before I was looking at an arbitrary Noetherian ring, and now I'm going to impose some stronger hypotheses. I'm going to assume that spec R sort of looks like a smooth manifold, so it's a so-called smooth K algebra. Uh, and suppose I have a projective module of rank equal to the dimension of that K algebra. All right, so what happened in topology? Here, I had a suitably generic section, and I looked at its vanishing locus, and there was a corresponding cohomology class that was point gray dual to that. All right. So you can try to do the same thing with the same caveat about what does a generic section actually mean. Um, but now, if I look at the vanishing locus of a generic section, uh, that's a, an algebraic subvariety, right? Uh, and so that algebraic subvariety is going to be, uh, in this case, it's what's typically called a zero cycle. And um, I need to understand sort of what sort of equivalence relation one can use to, to move these things around. Uh, I won't say too much about that, but let me just say that there is an obstruction uh, which lies in the Chow group of co-dimension D algebraic cycles. So the equivalence relation is rational equivalence, and I can move this zero cycle up to rational equivalence. Um, all right, so if you're familiar with the theory of turn classes, this was not the original definition. This is just sort of motivation, and Grothendieck had a very different idea about how to define these kinds of things uh, in algebraic geometry. But in the interest of not complicating the discussion, let me not, uh, let, me not let facts get in the way of a good story. So, uh, all right, so in topology, this obstruction was sufficient. If I looked at this cohomology class point gray dual to a generic section, then uh, its vanishing was allowed me to characterize when there was a no nowhere vanishing section. And uh, it's very explicit in this example that Swan wrote down uh, that you can compute these obstructions, and unfortunately, they aren't sufficient to guarantee uh, existence of a nowhere vanishing section. So if I look at the real two-sphere, so the affine variety, which is just given by the defining equation of the two-sphere, uh, you can look at the tangent bundle for this thing. It's a well-defined algebraic object, and you can compute a second turn class, and you can see that it vanishes, but there is a topological reason why this, this can't split off a free rank one sum end. So this changes the problem a little bit. We already see the situation is different in algebra than it is in topology. Uh, when, if ever, is this obstruction sufficient? And maybe the first thing you will notice here is that I talked about the real two-sphere, and the fact that we don't have a splitting depends on the topology of the real points. Uh, and maybe one of the first things you know about the real numbers is that it's not algebraically closed, because you don't have a square root of minus one. So maybe that's a, a hint. So it took a long time, but uh, it was observed that if you have an algebraically closed field and a smooth affine uh, algebra of dimension d, then the image of this stabilization function, uh, in fact, is characterized by the vanishing of the top turn class uh, under the assumption that k is algebraically closed. All right, so as soon as I get rid of that, uh, issue coming from the real points, uh, this is sufficient. So this, uh, this theorem has sort of a very, very long history. Um, and the d equals 2 case was uh, solved by Dick Swan and uh, Pavman Murthy in 1976. Uh, and this is sort of like classical ring theory, kind of really using the, the kinds of general position arguments and building those up uh, 
al -Aser. Um So they did more than this in that paper, but uh, it, took, it still took quite some time to move from there to dimension three. This was done by Mohan Kumar and Bob Manmurthy in 82. Um, and uh, again, they proved a little more than this, but it, it sort of took a while to, to, to use these classical techniques. And finally, it was uh, established in general by Murthy in, in 1994. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, I mean, this is sort of really classical ring theory. Um, so this leaves open a bunch of questions, which is uh, what happens if K is not algebraically closed? And um, can you do anything at all if you're in positive co-rank? All right, so I told you a topological story. Uh, I told you a story in algebra. And now I'd like to bring the story from algebra back to topology. So all right, so when we wanted to classify vector bundles in topology, we used this Grassmannian. Now, in algebraic geometry, we were interested in smooth algebraic varieties. Um, and if I look at the corresponding Grassmannian, it is an algebraic variety, but it's unfortunately infinite dimensional. So those are not objects that are necessarily so easy to study in algebraic geometry. Nevertheless, it is an increasing union of finite dimensional algebraic varieties. Um, we know how to describe this object. We know what a map from, say, a commutative ring or a spectrum of a commutative ring to this Grassmannian is. Uh, it's a vector bundle together with a collection of generating sections. And how do you get that? I mean, you pull back the universal bundle or the tautological bundle, just as in topology. So that is an algebraic vector bundle and uh, comes equipped with a surjection from a trivial bundle. All right. So in Fabian's talk, you heard a bit about naive homotopies. So I'd like to say a bit more about that. Um, so you can speak of naive homotopies between two algebraic maps. So what should that be? Well, I have a ring R. I can look at the polynomial ring in one variable over T. This has uh, uh, in, one, in one variable T over R. And uh, I can look at a map from this polynomial ring. And there are distinguished points in the polynomial ring, which correspond to evaluation at 0 and evaluation at 1. And uh, those give me a notion of naive homotopy between two such maps. All right. So here's a theorem. I'm not giving it an attribution, and I'll explain why in a second. Uh, but if k is a field and r is a regular k algebra, for example, a smooth one, uh, well, if I have a map to the Grassmannian that gives rise to a vector bundle by pullback, and What's the, what's the issue here? Well, if I have two different collections of generating sections, uh, then, and they're naively homotopic, how do I know that they give rise to the same vector bundle? All right, so that's, so surjectivity of this map here just follows from the fact that if I have a projective module, which is finally generated, I can always choose uh, a generating collection, a uh, collection of generating sections. So I can always lift from the collection of all morphisms. And uh, so the real question is what, what happens with naive homotopy equivalents? All right, or naive homotopy rather. So uh, let me just say this theorem is much harder than the corresponding topological analog. So let's just take the special case where R is a polynomial ring and some number of variables uh, over the field K. Then what are we saying? Well, here you can see that on the left-hand side, all maps are sort of naively homotopic to a point. So in other words, this is the claim that all vector bundles on a polynomial ring or all projective modules over a polynomial ring are actually free. All right? And uh, that's a theorem of Quillen and Suslin, uh, which is, provides an answer to a problem that was posed by Serre the 1950s. Uh, so what does this theorem really use? Well, you need to know, like I said, that if I have two different collections of generating sections, that I can build an A1 homotopy or a, a naive homotopy between them. Uh, and 
That, the fact that that can be done uses a difficult theorem, which is Lindell's verification of the basque and conjecture in the, in the geometric case. So basically, that's the analog of, that's the fact that uh, when I restrict, well, it tells me that if I look at uh, VR of spec R and VR of spec of R of T, then the, uh, the induced map is necessarily a bijection. All right, so corresponding to the projection map, so the inclusion of R and R of T. Um, all right, so well, this would be great, except uh, I unfortunately misspoke and said something about naive homotopy equivalence, but the, the basic problem is that naive homotopy is badly behaved. It's not an equivalence relation in general. Um, it turns out in this special case, it ends up being an equivalence relation, but that's something specific to the case of the Grassmannian. All right, so I also had to impose some condition, namely I assumed some sort of smoothness uh, and, or in this case I, I said regular, uh, and without that kind of hypothesis, there just isn't any notion of uh, homotopy invariance for vector bundles. All right, so let me now transition slowly to motivic homotopy theory. And I'll quickly repeat some of the things that Fabian mentioned. So we're gonna start with the category of smooth varieties, and you should think about this as sort of analogous to CW complexes, and you'd like to sort of do homotopy theory with smooth varieties. Unfortunately, the category of smooth varieties is sort of not big enough. Uh, I mean, already we've seen things like the Grassmannian are not there, and those are objects that we'd like to be present. And um, Fabian mentioned that you know, in topology, you can take quotients by open subschemes, and that's a reasonable thing to do. Uh, here, you'd like to do that, but it's not clear to what extent that that's a reasonable thing to do. So what we do is we enlarge the situation. So we start with the category of space-valued presheaves on smooth schemes. So Fabian used a more rigid model. He considered uh, presheaves of simplicial sets. And now we'd like to force two classes of maps to become equivalences. Um, <clears throat> so he looked at check, or he looked at Nisnevich hyper coverings. Um, I'm just gonna use check covers corresponding to Nisnevich covers, uh, not hyper covers. So let me force uh, all these check covers to become equivalences. And let me force the projection from x cross the affine line to x to be an equivalence. All right, and so if we do invert those classes of maps, then we get uh, the category of motivic spaces, and uh, well, I'm gonna write by analogy with topology, square brackets for maps in the associated homotopy category, and this is the moral Vavatsky motivic homotopy category, or A1 homotopy category. All right. It's not the same thing. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to say the word infinity category, but I said it now. Yeah, so that's the homotopy category of this, this infinity category. All right. <clears throat> okay, so as Fabian mentioned in his talk as well, um, if I have a smooth scheme X and I look at maps to the infinite projective space, so this is the increasing union of the finite dimensional uh, projective spaces, so this is also GR1, um, then in fact for any smooth scheme, this, is, this represents vector uh, line bundles. And as he also mentioned, unfortunately this fails for general smooth schemes for R bigger than or equal to two. And the reason is that if I don't restrict my attention to affine things, where I did have some notion of homotopy invariance, which came from Lindell's theorem, then uh, the functor isomorphism classes of vector bundles is just not homotopy invariant. So you can write down vector bundles on, well you can see already for P1 that 
this fails. All right, so um, nevertheless, if I restrict my attention to affine varieties, it turns out that the collection of naive homotopy classes of maps is very, very well behaved. And in fact, it coincides with the set of maps in the motivic homotopy category to uh, the Grassmannian. All right, so this has a long history. Um, Fabian proved this in 2006. Uh, there was some condition about R not equal to two and it was required that K be a perfect field. Uh, Marco Schlichting improved this proof in 2015. Uh, he removed the hypothesis that R was two and uh, but still required K to be perfect. Uh, so it simplified a part of Fabian's argument. Um, and then in 2015, in joint work with uh, Marco Iwa and Matthias Wendt, we gave a sort of self-contained proof of this. Uh, and sort of the key point is that the basket and conjecture, or in other words, homotopy invariance of vector bundles is all you need to, to prove this kind of statement. And so it works even in some geometric situations, uh, sorry, in some arithmetic situations, like I said in the theorem for the integers. All right, so now there's a reasonable homotopy category, uh, reasonable in the sense that it has many properties that Fabian uh, described in his talk and I think we'll continue to describe. Um, <clears throat> and so I can go back to my lifting problem and I can ask, well, uh, can I phrase this as a homotopical lifting problem? And in order to do that, I need to know that if I look at the corresponding stabilization map from the Grassmannian of R minus one planes to the Grassmannian of R planes, then I can describe its fiber in the motivic homotopy category. So I can understand the failure of this map to be an equivalence. Uh, now, I, I'm gonna talk about cells in, uh, in analogy with what happens in topology, but this is really just some sort of intuition. Um, but intuitively speaking, the fiber of this map is uh, sort of glue cells together to the Grassmannian of R planes, and uh, that's controlled by affine R space with the origin removed. All right, so I say we, but in fact, Fabian in his book, uh, A1 Algebraic Topology, uh, builds some version of obstruction theory in the motivic setting, uh, sort of the, shows that the Postikoff tower behaves well in this, in this setup. And at the end of the day, if we want to analyze these splitting problems, well, in topology, we need to know something about the homotopy of the R sphere. And in algebraic geometry, we're going to need something, need information about the motivic homotopy theory of affine space with the origin removed. All right, so, uh, hopefully you believe that that looks like a sphere, but we can be a little bit more precise about the sense in which it looks like a sphere. All right, so in motivic homotopy theory, there are two circles. Well, when I built this category, I introduced this topological direction. I looked at pre-sheaves of, of spaces, and so I can look at the thing that is the constant circle, so I'll call that the topological circle. And then there's this sort of more algebra geometric object, which is the multiplicative group, but in other words, the affine line with the origin removed, pointed by one. All right. If I look in this category of motivic spaces, then in fact, I do, so these are my sort of basic circles, and when I built this object, I could form various categorical constructions. Uh, in particular, it makes sense to form things like smash products, and so I can look at something like the projective line, and because it admits an open cover by two open sets that are the affine line, and those are contractible, and the intersection is, uh, is the multiplicative group, you can see that the projective line is equivalent to uh, S1 smash GM. And similarly, inductively, you can show that affine end space minus the origin is also a sphere, namely that one. And for later use, let me observe that affine n plus one space minus the origin is P1 smash A n minus the origin. And let me introduce the bigraded uh, convention for spheres that SPQ is SP minus one, SP, SP minus Q smash GM Q times. 
All right, so um, when we built this theory, we were looking at pre-sheaves of spaces, and we forced two classes of maps to be equivalents, so uh, the f imposing, forcing these sort of Nisnevich local equivalences uh, to be uh, equivalences is, is sort of like a sheaf condition, and so it's maybe not too surprising that, that weak equivalences or equivalences in this setup are detected by homotopy sheaves with respect to the Nisnevich topology. And uh, here, when I'm just looking at the thing that comes from the topological circle, so SI is just the topological circle smashed with itself I times, or in other words, the topological I sphere. Um, those play a sort of distinguished role in this setup. All right, so there's a fundamental theorem of Fabian, which uh, I hope you'll talk about. Will you talk about it? Okay, someone will talk about it. <clears throat> so for any n bigger than or equal to two, I can look at this, uh, this a n minus the origin, or s two n minus one n, and this is sort of highly connected from the standpoint of motivic homotopy theory. So this has sort of an intuitive uh, explanation. If I have a nice space, I can talk about it being A1 connected if any two points can be connected by a chain of affine lines. Now, in practice, I need more than that because I need some sort of sheaf condition, and so it's not sufficient to just do this over the base field. You have to do this over, well, uh, much more general things, but in fact, it's sufficient, it suffices to check it over any extension of the base field. So, <laughs> Maybe I'll just mention that this notion of A1 connectedness is kind of a, a strong geometric condition, maybe a strong arithmetic condition on, uh, on an algebraic variety. Um, and at least for a space like AN minus the origin, it turns out that there's a, there's a very kind of nice way to uh, describe higher connectivity. So you could think about the fundamental group by building chains of affine lines that sort of connect uh, into a loop. And, um, and then you can talk about two loops being homotopic by a naive homotopy, and in fact it suffices to consider such objects uh, for a n minus the origin. All right, so, um, I hope Joseph will also talk about this, but uh, you will? Okay. So then there's an absolutely fundamental computation. We know this space is sort of reasonably connected, uh, and we want to know what the first non-vanishing homotopy is, and this has this description. And for the moment, this is just some symbol, uh, which I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, but it plays an analog, I mean, it's a, it's a motivic analog of the integers, and um, you can understand sort of a, there's a sort of Brouwer degree description of where those things come from. Um, maybe I'll skip the vague idea of the proof if other people are gonna talk about it. Um, but roughly speaking, the Horevich theorem says that, well, this is the first non-vanishing homotopy, so basically that's some kind of homology, and uh, you'd like to define, describe that homology, and the homology is basically some free thing by means of the suspension isomorphism, namely it's the free abelian thing on, uh, on GM smash N. So one has to describe that, and what one does is basically gives the generators and relations picture of what that free sheaf of abelian groups is. Um, in fact, one gets much, much more than that. Uh, as part of this story, uh, one needs to know what kind of sheaves these are, and so <clears throat> this is sort of the beginning of a, of a long story which is told in A1 algebraic topology over a field. All right, so I'll state Fabian's theorem of the Euler class. Um, all right, so going back to the situation in topology, we observed that there was a primary obstruction, which was the only one if I had a variety of dimension d, and <clears throat> so there's an analogous setup in algebraic geometry. Uh, if I have a rank d algebraic vector bundle on a smooth variety of dimension d, then, then I can look at the primary obstruction, and by essentially the exact same argument as in topology, this lies in some, some cohomology group, which is, the dth cohomology of x with coefficients in some sheaf, and uh, 
I mentioned this orientation character that arose in the topological situation, and in the motivic setup, it's played by, the role is played by the determinant of the vector bundle. Um, and so this cohomological obstruction is sufficient to guarantee uh, that E splits off a free rank on some n. All right, so there's two statements here. First, there's a statement that there is some purely cohomological obstruction. Uh, once I know what that first homotopy sheaf is, that's sort of formal to, to describe what, the, what this obstruction is as some, some cohomology class. What's more interesting is that this cohomology class has some nice description in terms of geometric objects. And that's what the equal sign on the right is supposed to tell you. Uh, this Chow tilde D is the Chow Witt group of co-dimension D cycles on X twisted by the determinant. And roughly speaking, uh, an element of this, this group is not a zero cycle, but it's a zero cycle decorated with some more information. Namely, there's some quadratic form information at uh, each point over which we're not vanishing. So there's a nice description of that group on the right in terms of enhanced zero cycles, or zero cycles with additional quadratic form data, subject to a more complicated equivalence relation, something a little more uh, involved than rational equivalence. But let me observe that that description allows me to connect with the top churn class. If I think about these things as sort of zero cycles decorated with additional information, then I can sort of forget that additional information or just get an integer out of it, and that'll give me a zero cycle in the classical sense. So there's a map from this thing to the classical Chow group of codimension D cycles, uh, and it sends the Euler class to the top churn class. So the left-hand side, like I said, is just obstruction theory in some suitably souped up way. All right. So there's a lot to be said about connecting with the right-hand side, and um, I'm going to avoid that for the time being. So instead, what I'd like to do is, in the last couple of minutes, uh, talk about the higher cases. I mean, I spent a while talking about the Euler class and the co-rank zero case in topology. And then you could go beyond that and study the corresponding situation in co-rank one. And there's an old conjecture of Murthy from 1997. Uh, and initially, this was formulated as a problem. If you have uh, a variety of dimension d plus 1 over an algebraically closed field and a rank d vector bundle, so one less than the dimension of the variety, uh, then when does it split off a trivial rank 1 sum n? So well, his claim was that well, what he wrote is that I know of no example where the vanishing of the top churn class was not sufficient to guarantee this. So there's a maybe first case where you can analyze this problem, namely if uh, d is equal to 1. In that case, we're looking at line bundles on a surface, on an affine surface, and then the first churn class is basically the isomorphism class of the vector bundle. So there isn't much to say in that case. Uh, so it's true in that case. And uh, then the question is, what happens in general? So I spent a long time describing the situation in topology. And I think the important point was that there was a primary obstruction, which was the Euler class. But then there was a secondary obstruction, which was this thing involving some more complicated cohomology operation. Now, I've also set this up so that I just mentioned Fabian's theorem, which said that if k was not algebraically closed, then even the primary obstruction was more involved because it involves some sort of quadratic form data. So this conjecture sort of involves, I mean, if it has any hope of being true, it involves two things. First of all, one has to connect the churn class to the Euler class. So you'd like to know that vanishing of the Euler class is sufficient to guarantee vanishing of the top, uh, vanishing of the top churn class is sufficient to guarantee vanishing of the Euler class. And then you need to know something about the next obstruction. All right. So some recent stuff. 
Um, if you have an algebraically closed field, and now I'm gonna assume it has characteristic zero, uh, then in fact, Morthy's conjecture is true. Um, and this builds on work with of myself and Jean Fazel. Uh, we treated the cases uh, D is equal to two and three, uh, which I'll discuss momentarily. Um, let's see, how am I doing on time? Six minutes. Six minutes. All right, I think I might postpone some of this to the next, next lecture. All right, let me just say one thing and then I'll, I'll close. Um, so in topology, remember, when I was interested in describing the homotopy of this, the sphere, uh, I had to introduce this notion of stable range. So uh, in topology, the notion of stable range comes from Freudenthal's suspension theorem. Uh, so if I look at the n-sphere and I look at the, the unit map to the loops and the suspension of that, uh, I can figure out what the, I can measure the failure of that map to be a homotopy equivalence in some range, and uh, in fact, there's a nice description of the fiber in, in some good situations, but in particular, the fiber has some, some nice connectivity. All right, so this tells me that the homotopy groups stabilize in a range. All right, so, Fabian established an essentially exact an analog of this statement for S1 suspension uh, in motivic homotopy theory. That's also in his book, uh, A1 Algebraic Topology over a Field. But as I mentioned, we're interested in the homotopy of An minus the origin. That's what is interceding in this problem. And so what we'd like to understand if we wanna use uh, Motivic homotopy theory is sort of, well, how does P1 suspension interact with computing homotopy? So here, we run into a basic problem, which is that the Freudenthal suspension theorem is false for P1 suspension without further hypotheses. So these computations are basically contained in Fabians, but if you look at the nth homotopy of the n-sphere, uh, the topological n-sphere, that's just the integer z, and uh, if you look at the nth homotopy of the P1 loops on the P1 suspension of Sn, then this is not Z, All right? Okay, so maybe I'll quit there and uh, I'll talk about how one deals with this problem next time.